I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired software engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. Today, I have the privilege and pleasure of interviewing Raymond Chen, who actually started at Microsoft back in the early 90s along with me, but who has remained there until today, some 30 years later. He's been working primarily on the Windows user interface for three decades and knows as much or more about its internals than practically anyone else I can think of. Back in the day, when I had a problem to solve, if I got stuck, it was Raymond that I'd go to see. Raymond has a great book on Windows development, a mix of stories and practical advice. It's called The Old New Thing and I highly recommend it, so I'll put a link to it in the video description. With that introduction out of the way, let's jump right in and have a chat with Raymond. Um, behind you there on the shelf is a box copy of Windows 95 with stripes. With Ooh, stripes. stripes. Yes, that makes Commemorative. it special. Yes, if you look at the box, it says special edition, I believe. Um, I've never taken the shrink wrap off, so I assume there is magical contents inside. But. Yes, in fact, there is nothing magical about that box at all. The <laughs> only thing special about that box is the box. The product inside is just a standard retail copy of Windows 95. They just put it in a special box. So the Windows 95 special edition box is special for the box. I thought the racing stripes would make it go faster, but no. The Windows pinball has turned into something of a conspiracy theory with people with videos out there promoting the idea that perhaps they suppressed the 64-bit versions or they were hidden from the world. Um, what was the deal with 64-bit pinball and why did it not ship? And why yeah. did pinball get removed from the product ultimately? Yeah, pinball, the great pinball conspiracy. So should I should I further the conspiracy or should I debunk the conspiracy? I could try either way. We'll record like, both, how's I'm, that? Like, I'm being recorded, this is gonna go up on YouTube. Like, I could just decide to like go rogue and go full <laughs> conspiracy. And then everybody's gonna like say, oh my goodness, it's, it's actually a conspiracy. I saw it on YouTube. Like, here's my chance to spread disinformation. You could go that way? But I'm not going to. Okay. I thought about it though. <laughs> See, this is what happens. I come here and then I get crazy ideas. And I'm like, I could totally pull one over on everybody, but I'm not, I'm not that kind of person. When the Windows, the 64-bit Windows project was getting off the ground, um, these were, or the original target of 64-bit Windows was the Itanium processor, which uh, I saw a news article recently, Linux finally dropped support for the Itanium, like, like 15 years after Intel stopped making them. Right. Um, and I'm sure all like 50 people who still own Itaniums are very sad. Um, but, uh, so, but at the time, Intel still believed in Itanium and it was the, it was their first 64 bit processor and the windows was being ported to it. And the, the kernel was finally ported enough that you could boot to a command prompt. And they said, this is great. We can now boot Windows to a command prompt. It would be really nice if the GUI worked. So they asked me and a couple other people to go off and port the shell to 64, 64-bit code. So we like sat down and spent, I don't know, a few weeks, something like that, uh, just doing this massive port, porting Porting thousands of files, you know, getting them to, trying to get them to build, see all the compiler errors, fix all the compiler errors, and eventually it's like, oh, we finally have a binary, and we put it on a machine and see if it runs. And uh, the story of Pinball was that yes, I successfully got Pinball to build and run 64-bit. However, you couldn't play the game because when you hit the plunger to launch the ball, the ball would come into the chute and then just fall out the bottom of the out the bottom of the table because something was went wrong with the collision detection so the ball would just pass through all the walls it would pass through the plunger it would just fall out the bottom of the table and i we didn't have time to like go through and actually like debug why collision detection was not working. We still had another, you know, 90,000 file, 90,000 files to port or however many files it is. Like we still hadn't done solitaire. Like we still have to deport solitaire. I can't spend all my time on pinball. Um, so yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe, maybe pinball was more important, but we just, I just, we just made the decision. It's like, okay, our goal is to port as much as we can. And if we spend four days trying to figure out 
why pinball is not working, that's going to cut into a lot of our time budget. So we just set pinball aside and, and ported as much as we could. And we never had time to get back to pinball. So we just made the executive decision right there is that, well, the Itanium's target is high-end server systems. You probably aren't going to be playing pinball on the server in your data center. So if we took pinball out of the project, like the intended target audience wouldn't really care. Um, in fact, they would probably be thankful that pinball wasn't on the machine because it meant that you you spent forty thousand dollars on this big honking machine, and you you don't want the people in the data center playing pinball all day on it. Um, so we we just made the call. It's like okay, we'll just take pinball out of the product, uh, and so that's why pinball, as far as I knew, was not in Windows sixty uh, four bit edition. But then some enterprising people found like beta copies and other things, and found that pinball was back. And so then they're like, hey, you lied to me. Pinball's back. What happened? And the answer is, I don't know what happened. <laughs> the when I left the story, they're like it was it was like that when I left it. Uh, pinball was not in the product when I handed the port of the shell. Like we got Explorer and everything all working when I handed the port of Explorer back to uh, the 64-bit team, uh, and like I didn't hear back from the. It's like presumably somebody figured out what was wrong with pinball and. Looking at some of the some of the research that other people have done, I'm thinking it was a floating point rounding issue. Um, uh, so it could be that there was like a problem in the C runtimes that they found where floating point rounding was not working quite right because the a the Alpha AXP did have a more complicated floating point system than the than the Intel math coprocessor. Like the Intel math coprocessor has an 80-bit intermediate floating point, which can mask a whole bunch of uh, calculation errors because you're, calculating, you're, you're extending your intermediate calculations from 64-bit to 80-bit. So this gives you a little more, uh, more precision or accuracy, one of those words. Gives you more stuff, gives you more mantissa. Um, but the alpha, I think the Alpha had like three different floating point formats. You had to like pick it. It's like, oh, am I going to use floating point F or G or something? And I guess the the way the math worked out, just some of the rounding went the wrong way and collision didn't work. Um, but I guess... Did it work the, equally across all the CPUs or was it particular CPUs had an issue? Like was it Intel versus AXP versus Itanium or was it all 64-bit? It's interesting. So we only had two 64-bit processors available. One was the Itanium. And at the time, it we didn't even have physical Itanium hardware. It ran only in simulation. So you could turn on your Itanium simulator and boot Windows, and a couple hours later, it might finish booting. And so this was not practical. Like, right. you can't play pinball on a machine that runs at 0.1% of full speed. Um, and so what we did was we took all of our old Alpha AXPs, because Microsoft had already retired Alpha AXP as a Windows target. Um, and But there were still all these Alpha AXPs still you know, sitting in developers' offices, like, doing nothing. And so they're like, hey, guys, we found something to do with your Alpha AXPs. And so the kernel team actually ported Windows to the Alpha AXP and said, guess what? We have Windows running on a 64-bit processor. It's not the one we plan on shipping with, but that one's not ready yet. So why don't we port to this guy first? And the expectation was that most of the porting problems were independent of the specific CPU it was, that most of the porting problems would just be in getting any 64-bit version working at all. Okay. Uh, and so all of our actual testing and validation at this stage was done on Alpha AXP because that was the only 64-bit processor that actually existed. So yes, we had this collision detection problem on Alpha AXP. We had no idea if we had this collision problem on Itaniums because Itaniums didn't exist. The physical hardware didn't exist yet. Okay. Um, but my guess is that other testing, maybe like running some mathematical tests or something, they identified some sort of rounding problem and fixed it in the C runtimes, and then that magically made pinball work again. That's my guess as to what happened. It could be that somebody sat down and spent a weekend trying to figure out what was wrong with pinball. It's like this person really, really wanted pinball to work on his data center machine. 
Uh, I do not know what happened. But uh, at any rate, somehow Pinball started working again and they put it back in the product. This happened without my knowing. So when I told the story, Pinball wasn't there when I when I was when I handed 64 bit windows uh, back to the back to the kernel team. OK. You once got a death threat over X copy, I recall. Oh, my goodness. So, <laughs> yes, I received an X. I received a death threat. There was a person who wrote wrote in to product support, very upset about the X copy program. I don't even remember what it was. System or hidden files, I think, being copied properly, if I remember. Oh, they were upset about how it handled system and hidden files. Yeah. This person was not having a good day, was very upset, and included in the message saying, if I find out who did this, I will, I will kill them. And so technically, since I was the person who did this, uh, technically, I guess that would mean that I did receive a death, death threat. As far as I know, there has been no attempt to follow through on it. Well, that's because the switch did actually exist in Xcopy, I believe. He just wasn't aware of it. So oh, you escaped with your life just on oh, the that's right. merits I escaped of having with my life because the switch did in fact exist. He just didn't know about there it. There you go. So, so that's right. That was that was my my way of begging for my life. It was like the switch is there. It, trust me, it's in there. Just try it. So, what, when, and where, and how did your path take you to Microsoft originally? It was senior year of college, and I had already sent out my applications for graduate school. I was a math student and I heard and hadn't heard anything back. So I was getting kind of nervous. I'm like, oh, wow, if I don't get into grad school, I should probably like get a job. Like, what's all that about? Like, I had always considered myself an academic and say, like, oh, I should, I should probably get a like get a backup plan and and get a job somehow. Um, and so I went to the career, the career center and looked at who was interviewing. It, it just so happened Microsoft was interviewing that week. And I'm like, yeah, I can probably pull off one of these. So I signed up and I came in and the interviewer asked me to um, to reverse engineer some super optimized 8086 assembly language, um, which was for me just like a fun little puzzle. It's like, hey, how do you take the absolute value of a number in like oh, four one. instructions, I right? So, that. but but it was, but it was- New it, at it's, the time, for sure. Yeah, it was, this, this was like cutting edge at the time. Um, and so, you know, it'd be like, hey, here's a little snippet of assembly language. Tell me what it does. And I'd like work it out. It's like, oh, that's really cool. This is like, uh, this is um, uh, calculating the max of two numbers without any branches. That's awesome. Um, and apparently they were satisfied with that enough to call me out for, uh, for an in summer internship interview. Um, and apparently I passed because they, they brought me in. So you were um, an intern first then? So I, I was an intern. Uh, in the meantime, my graduate school application I, I got answers back and I actually got into one of them. So it's like, okay, I will do a summer internship for a year and then go to graduate school. So I did a summer internship at Microsoft that was in 89. And I worked on, believe it or not, the MS-DOS emulation layer in OS 2.0. So MS-DOS emulation is clearly something I've been working on for a very, very long time. Um, and I... Specifically, I did the uh, extended memory driver for OSU 2.0's uh, DOS emulation layer. And then after that, after the summer was over, I went back to school. And then the next summer, I was like, you know, I kind of like working during the summer. That was pretty neat. So I came back to Microsoft again. They were happy to have me. And the second summer, I worked on OS 2 1.3 printing. Um, which was not an enjoyable project. Uh, and so I sort of decided that I would not work on printing anymore. So I haven't worked on printing anymore. Um, bef while I was in college during the summer, I did database programming for another, for a very small company. And that's also why I haven't done any database programming. So I've already realized what types of projects I like and what I don't. Uh, and I stay away from printing and databases. So if you have a question for me about printing or databases, I'm going to skip it and go on to the next one. How do I print my database? How do you print your database? <laughs> you go and ask somebody who cares. So you're wearing a tie. I seem to remember Make Raymond Wear Normal Clothes Day. Do you remember that? I wasn't on your team at the time. I was in the Inti Shell team, but uh, 
I, I remember some of the details. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. So my, my, uh, my shtick at work was that I actually wore a jacket and tie to, to, uh, to work. And this was a holdover from my, uh, high school days. I went to a school that had a jacket and tie dress code. Okay. Uh, and so I is like, Oh, you have a job now. You should like dress like grownups do. And the only grown up clothes I had were jackets and ties. So in a way, uh, I wore jackets and ties more out of necessity because it was the only clothes I had. Um, but it turned into a, a thing. Everybody, like, I was known as the guy who wore a jacket and tie to work every day. And, uh, as a, as a joke, or maybe as a prank, or as a jokey prank, or a pranky joke. As a sort of joke, prank thing, the members of the team said, hey, what would it take to get Raymond to not wear a jacket and tie to work? And when, you know, so, so there's like, you know, everybody's like trying to come up with their ideas. And when I, when I heard about this, I said, oh, I decided to say, okay, here's the deal. I will wear normal clothes to work if everybody else wears a jacket and tie. Um, and for some reason, people thought this was cool and actually wore a, a jacket and tie to, to work. Um, so... And I turned it into a fundraiser for, for my high school. So I, I said, everybody who participates, you know, I will donate $10. For each person who participates, I will donate $10 to my high school. So my high school still has me on their donor list because uh, they, got a, they got a good amount of money out of it. Good. But you made them wear shoes and a tie and a jacket, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We made it clear in the rules that it's like you, it, Raymond will wear normal clothes and in exchange, you need to wear a suit. But by suit, we mean like business suit or um, uh, like school school uniform type right. suit. Um, no birthday suits, no swimsuits. <laughs> like we, we, you know, it's like try, understand the spirit in which the exercise is undertaken. Uh, and nobody tried to push the rules. I think we did have one person dress in come in military dress. Which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, especially if they're entitled, you know, if they're. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's it, this wasn't cosplay. Like <laughs> <laughs> he really had it, and and it's like, yeah, you're you're pretty probably like dressed smarter than everybody else here. <laughs> like you kind of win. It wasn't a competition, but you kind of won with that. So there was a time there when our offices were like two doors apart, and I remember if I would get stuck on something, I would always be very tempted to let's just go ask Raymond because I know Raymond knows, but I don't want to just be lazy and just <laughs> ask Raymond all the time. So it was always nice to know you were there. Who does Raymond ask? Does uh, it really depend on the area of domain expertise or are there people? Yeah, I guess one advantage of having been at Microsoft for a long time is that I have a lot of names in my Rolodex. Right. And so if I run into a problem and it's like, oh, I'm running into a problem with networking. It's like, I I have friends on the networking team and I can just like ring them up. And so right. it's it's not like there's one person I go to, but... I know I know a lot of people around the around around the company. Most of them owe me favors, and so I get to cash in a favor once in a while. Any good registry stories? Why do we call it a hive? <laughs> <laughs> so the developer who implemented the registry code found out that another developer on the team really didn't like bees. Like was, I don't know if he like was, was like scared of them or he like aggressively disliked them <laughs> or he just thought they were too smug or something, but he didn't like bees. And so the developer who was writing the registry code decided to needle his colleague by naming all of the data structures in the registry after things related to bees. And so registry keys are kept in units called cells, which are the little hexagonal things inside the hive. And the registry, the main registry file itself is called a hive. So he basically tried to jam as many bee related <laughs> terms into the registry code, uh, specifically just, just to just to annoy his, his colleague who didn't like bees. So if you wonder now why a registry 
a registry file is called a hive. It's, it's because um, one of the lead developers of the IO system didn't like bees. UI question for you. As far as my wife is concerned, the correct answer to any dialogue that she's not 100% sure about is cancel in all cases. And I think a lot of users do that. Have you ever seen manifestations of that? Like whenever, whenever face, whenever faced with a confusing question, just always like, just try to find a way to not answer the question, which usually means like hit the X or right. try to cancel out. Like there were, I remember we would like, one of the things that we would do in the development team is we would take time to go into the product support, sit in with product support to, um, understand how people are using windows. And so, uh, during one of these product support listen-ins, I remember one person called in was having some sort of problem and the product support person was working with them on it. And the person said, is like, I have this problem. And the, it's like, yeah, well, we, we, we already identified this problem, but we should have, uh, made an update available to fix this. Um, so when you, when you turn on your computer, do you get a little, a little, message in the corner that says updates are available and they said yeah i i think so there's always this thing that shows up on my screen when i turn it on but i don't understand it so i just like close it make it go away your mach machines were not continuously connected to the internet you had to like dial in and windows is probably not going to sit there and it's like oh you're dialed in let me see if i can download a gigabyte of service updates it's like you know well we'll try to like you know, take, take a little here, take a little there. Oh, oh wait, he's actually browsing. Let me back off that type of thing. Um, and so people were just not used to the idea of an operating system that updated itself. Um, and so when this dialogue came up saying, Hey, there's an update available, click here to download it. They're like, I, I didn't ask for an update. Like, what's all this? Like, go away. I'm trying to use my computer. Um, and so this is just a, a general lesson that you learn from doing user interface work is that uh, when you display a dialogue to, to people, you want to try to get it so they will at least somewhat understand what it's about. But if any part of it is at all scary, they're just going to say no and do try to get that thing to go away as fast as possible. Like, this document contains macros. Do you, I, like, I don't care. If the answer, if there's an option between yes and no, they're just going to say no. Um, and so part of it is also you want to phrase your question so that we know is always the safe answer. Right, exactly. Why was the time zone map so challenging in Windows 95? And why, if I pick Formosa, does it not highlight my home area? Ah, uh, the time zone map. So Windows 95 introduced the time zone map. This was like you go to the control panel, call up and pick your time zone just by clicking on the map. And that was really cool. And it was cute. And it would animate in and it would highlight it. And everybody thought that was a lot of fun. Um, until geopolitics entered the entered the picture. So the Windows team used the official United Nations recognized maps to determine uh, where all the boundaries were. But of course, not all countries agree with the official maps uh, published by the United Nations. In fact, there are boundary disputes all over the world there like, even today, I think the United States probably still has a boundary dispute with Canada somewhere. Um, fortunately, there's there's no military aggression. But you know, like I remember there yeah. was the story about like that island, but that was in dispute between Canada and Denmark, and uh, but the the conflict was just asserted by each country whenever they visited that island, they would uh, plant their flag on the island and leave a bottle of alcohol, a bottle of whiskey or something on the island. And then when the other country came to visit, they would take down the other country's flag, put up there and put replace it with their own alcohol. Um, and so, you know, even today we have these uh, border disputes. But back then we were young and naive and thought it's like, everybody loves the United Nations. We'll just, you know, if it's the United Nations says so, everybody must be happy. But of course, it, uh, people were not happy. There was a border war in South America. I forget exactly which countries they were were involved. And so, of course, the countries complained that, hey, you're, you're giving these like three pixels to that other guy. And those pixels rightfully belong to us. Um, one notable example of this is that there is a, a border dispute uh, between India and Pakistan 
over uh, a region uh, that's along their border. And one of the there's actually a law in India that says that if you produce a map whose boundaries do not match the official government borders, you have to put a stamp on it that says this map is incorrect. Um, now, the Windows 95 time zone picker did not bear the stamp that said this border is incorrect. And there really was no facility for putting a stamp on a bunch of pixels on your screen. It's like, well, we could put a stamp on your monitor, but then your monitor's got a sticker on it or something. Um, and in addition to the, you know, these, these border wars, there were even arguments from countries who were not engaged in a border conflict where like a small European country would contact us and say, Hey, can, can, can you like our, our country is kind of small. Can you give us one of our neighbor's pixels to make it easier to click on? Cause our guys, our, our citizens are having trouble clicking on that thing. Cause we have to hit a really tiny target. And then the other country would, we'd get a re response from the other country saying, uh, or, or from some country saying, Hey, why did you give one of our pixels to our neighbor? Like if you look at the map, that pixel belongs to us. Like, and it's like, there was no military conflict here, but they were just like, you know, out of nationalistic pride is like that, that pixel is more than 50%, you know, our countries, like it should be, it should be ours. Like, why won't you give us our pixel? Um, and it's basically impossible to satisfy everybody on all of these things. And so we just made the decision. It's like, you know what? We're just, we will rotate the map to put your country or your time zone, like, in the center. So it looks like, Hey, there you are right in the middle, but we're not going to highlight anything. So nobody can complain. It was like, Oh, you gave, you gave too many pixels to our neighbor over there. It's like, I want that pixel. It's like, well, nobody gets any pixels. Um, there was a bug that we introduced when we did that though, because the way the time zone map works is that we had a map of the world and it was, Basically, it was color coded. We assigned a, a color to every time zone, and the idea was that oh, if you picked, uh, you know, uh, United States Pacific time, we would say oh, okay, that's green, and so we would find all the green pixels on the map and highlight them, and then all the other pixels on the map we dim them, uh, and so we just use the color coding as a way to identify pixels on the map, but what we showed to the user only showed either bright you know, either a, a bright green or, or dark green for highlighted or not highlighted. Um, and so we, we just took out all the coloring code, but the map was still there. It is just that we just, we, we just, we, we still used the map to identify where land and ocean was. Now, the problem was that at some point, Poland, there were some changes to the time zone information for Poland. And as a result, Poland sort of merged with its neighbors and agreed to use like Central European time or Eastern. So there was some common time zone that a bunch of these countries decided to use together. And as a result, uh, Poland's time zone was assigned to match those of its neighbors, but we forgot to update the colors in the map. And so as a result, Poland's time zone, the original like exclusive to Poland time zone disappeared. Okay. Because nobody was using it anymore. And as a result, when you went to the world map, the time zone picker map, there was ocean where Poland is supposed to be because we went through all the code. We went through all the time zones. Like, oh, every time there's a time zone, it's like, great, color him, color him green because he's, he's not ocean anymore. But since the originally the original time zone assigned to Poland was just deleted from the list because nobody used it, we forgot that the map used it. And so Poland never, you can think of it as like every time we saw a time zone, we like raised it, we raised it out of the ocean and gave it, you know, gave it dry land. And Poland just like stayed at the bottom of the ocean. Lake Poland. Yeah. So there's, I forget exactly when we finally fixed it, but there is a, a period of time where if you went to the time zone map, uh, instead of Poland, you saw uh, what we called the Great Polish Sea. Why has taskbar grouping been like the major focus of computer science for 20 years, it seems, and they haven't figured it out? ChatGPT figured it out? What's the right way to group taskbar buttons? 
The right way to group taskbar buttons is actually a complicated problem. Right. Um, because like, it's obvious to a human being looking at things, it's like, oh yeah, well, those two things are clearly different. And those two things are clearly the same. But that, the taskbar doesn't see things that way. The taskbar sees like names of running programs. It's like, oh, this program created a window. I will, I, I will uh, remember, oh, these windows all came from the same program. But then you have other types of programs that sort of act as, as, um, frameworks for other programs to run inside. For example, Python. Like if the taskbar relied only on the executable, then all your Python programs would all get jammed together because they're all running python.exe. Right. But you're but you know, you the human being looking at it, so, well clearly that's not because this is my Python program for, you know, doing the game of life and this is my Python program that I used to chunk some database and uh, and so, you know, the human being says, well, these programs are clearly not related. Why are you grouping them? It's like, well, because they're both Python. I was like, well, don't do that anymore. And it's like, okay, and I have to come up with some rule for deciding when I should decide that two Pythons are the same and when they aren't. And so there are these rules. They're written, they're in the, in the documentation. If, if you're a program like Python, so, you know, you don't want all of your Pythons to be grouped together because logically you're not really the program that the user is thinking about. The user is thinking about the script that the Python program is running. Um, then you should do these things to your windows to get them broken up separately. And then there's the reverse problem where there's like um, a group of programs that all work together, like like a uh, like a productivity suite, where like oh here's Word and here's the Word equation editor, and they are actually two different programs. But you want them to group together because to the end user, it's like, no, it's Word and the Word Equation Editor. They, clearly, they are the same program. It's like, but if you look at the executable names, it's like, no, one's word.exe and one is eqed or something like that. And so now you also have to, in addition to taking programs that match on the executable and artificially splitting them apart, you also have to do work to identify programs that look like they belong together and artificially uh, glue them together. And so again, there's documentation on how you can like write your program and like do things to help the taskbar identify which things really belong together and which things really uh, should be kept separate. And it's uh, it's hard. Like maybe we can just make ChatGPT do it. Right. That's right. What I was it's thinking. like, hey, now that we have this thing, he's like, hey, you just like look at these look at these windows. Like here's a screenshot. Here are all the windows. Like you tell me how they should be grouped. And you know. 20 seconds later, you'll have your answer. Well, 20, 20 <laughs> seconds later, you'll have your answer and it'll be 80% correct. Right, there you go. And then you'll wonder why, hey, these two things grouped okay yesterday, but today they're separate. Like, what's going on? It's like, well, ChatGPT decided that they, you know, random number generators, they were different today. Um, you wrote a book a number of years ago, The Old New Thing. Great book. I'll link to it in the video description and recommend people check it out. Uh, one of the stories you have in there relates to vending machine user interface design and how the prices and the selection items should be designed so it doesn't cause confusion. And it seemed really non obvious I mean, it's obvious once you know it. Can you tell that story? Do you remember that one? Oh, yeah. This was, this was when I was, like, learning about, learning about uh, what do they call it nowadays? HCI, human-computer interaction, but basically just, like, how to design things so the user interface is less annoying. Um, and so one of the problems that I saw when I was in college when you're in college, you spend a lot of time getting snacks from vending machines. And one of the things I noticed in the vending machine was that there would be a snack that costs like a dollar forty-five. And so you put in your money, uh, and then you type in because it costs a dollar forty-five. That's the number you're thinking of. So you punch in one forty-five. But the machine doesn't want you to punch in the price. The machine wants you to punch in the code of the item you're buying. Um, and so you would accidentally buy item 145, which would be like some candy bar that you're allergic to. Um, and he's like, oh, rats, I bought that. I meant to buy item number 157 because that's the actual item code number. But I just, out of, you know, out of absent-mindedness, I punched in the price because that's the number I was thinking of. Especially the days of two-digit two pricing when you could buy things for 45 cents, it was even more confusing, I'm sure. 
That's right. Because that because usually what they did is they just numbered everything from like one one, one two, one three, right. and then two one, two two, two three, all the way out. So when you got something like a stick of gum or a pack of gum for forty five cents, and then you would punch in forty five, but then you wouldn't get the pack of gum, you would get whatever was in row four, column five. Right. And so my my fantastic um, realization was that you just should make sure your item numbers don't match your, the prices of the, the items because this is a mistake that people make. Nowadays, they solve this problem in other ways. Like they'll have the items use letters instead yes. of numbers. So you if you type in the price... Nothing happens because it's like, no, there's no item called 145. You want to type like E7 or something. Right. So at least they figured that out. It's like, okay, we make sure that the price of something never matches the code of something because people often, when you're in a hurry, you're hungry, right? You're not thinking straight. You'll just like punch in whatever number occurs to you. Uh, what do you remember of Bunny, Bear, and Piglet from the Windows team? Uh, Bunny, Bear, and Piglet were three little stuffed animal mascots that the team had. Um, Bear is the oldest one. Bear was the mascot for, I believe it was Windows 3.1. Bear was just a little stuffed animal, stuffed little teddy bear, um, that was carried around by one of the uh, one of the development managers, Dev Leads. Um, he carried it around sort of like a security blanket, like you know, like a like a kid would would carry a stuffed animal, and uh, but of course, uh, this was the day where people expected software developers to be somewhat eccentric, uh, and so everybody just like, yeah, there's Dave. He carries a stuffed animal around. You know, what are you gonna do? Um, not you, Dave. Different Dave. You know, I once walked in and I was holding my stuffed orca, and he had his stuffed orca, and we what met in the hallway by mistake. So oh, so it was the, the meeting of the stuffed animals. It was. Um, but, but of course, one of the things that you do when you're, you're, one of your uh, developers carries a stuffed animal around is, of course, you steal said stuffed animal and hide it um, and then cause, um, cause the other Dave to say, has anybody, has anybody seen Bear? And then there would be like, you'd like leave a clue. It's like getting colder. And, you know, this, is, this was all in fun. Uh, Dave seemed to be okay with the, the, um, the joking around. He would. Uh, he he was he was semi complicit in the, in the in the joshing. So it was not mean spirited. It right. was it was all it was all in this the spirit of the exercise. Uh, so bear was the mascot for I can't remember if it was Windows three point or three point one. If you go and find the either three point or three point oh three point one Easter egg, it will show a list of credits and it will also show uh, an image. And I believe one of the images that cycle through is a little stuffed animal teddy bear. So that was, that was bear. And I believe bear is even credited as bear uh, in the, in the Easter egg. So that was bear. That was bear was the mascot for one of the windows three point somethings. And one of the ways that bear manifested itself in the product was that all of the internal functions that were used to communicate between the window manager and the graphic system and the kernel uh, tended to be named bear and then a number uh, to tell people it's like this is just an internal function like don't don't call it but we knew that like oh yeah the function that you know that like takes a device context and and returns you a region that tells you which pixels are visible on screen right now that's bear 23. So if you're going through the code, then there would be a header file with a macro saying pound define and give it a, a decent name, but then it maps to bear23. And so if you were if you're reading the source code, the source code looked normal. But then if you looked at the the final output, the name of the function in the DLL would be like bear23. And so the idea here was just to tell people it's like, you're you're not meant to call this function. This is just for our internal purposes and we we can change it anytime we want. And so Bear, Bear showed up and hung around as the name of uh, internal functions in the system. In Windows 3.1, we, and I'm sorry, in Windows 95, uh, Dave picked up a new stuffed animal called Bunny. Uh, and so it was just a little stuffed pink bunny. Um, so now, now we had two stuffed animals we could steal from him and hide. Um, 
which of course we did. Um, and, uh, and so Bunny sort of became the mascot of the user interface team. So most of their internal functions were called Bunny something something. Um, Dave also bought a larger stuffed animal bunny. And so the smaller one was nicknamed 16-bit bunny. And the okay. larger one was nicknamed 32-bit bunny. Um, because Windows 95 was the transition operating system where we moved 16-bit, uh, uh, moved pieces of the six, uh, operating system from 16-bit to 32-bit and added support for 32-bit applic 32 applications while continuing to run the 16-bit applications. Um, and so we had, so now we had three stuffed animals. We had Bear, who was semi-retired at this point. We had Bunny, and we had, we had 16-bit uh, Bunny, and we had 32-bit Bunny. Meanwhile, the kernel team sort of felt left out of all of this stuffed animal hey, mayhem. And so one of the members of the kernel team, Mike, he had a stuffed animal piglet, piglet from Winnie the Pooh. Uh, just a little piglet sitting uh, in his office. And so he decided that, you know, I'm just going to decide piglet's the motto, the, the mascot of the kernel team. And so kernel functions, the internal kernel functions, were just all were named piglet something something. So now you will see uh, functions called bunny and then a number or piglet and a number. And that also means that these are functions not meant to be used by applications, but, were, but are instead used uh, by the operating system to accomplish its own internal tasks. What was the USB cart of death and how many people died? Uh, the USB cart of death was, uh, it did not kill any people, but it did kill a lot of builds. So when the USB, when USB was first being developed, of course, every, the kernel team, the divide, the USB team is put together and they're like frantically writing code to support this new hardware hardware device and protocol and all these other things. And the USB cart of death was one of those um, like office carts, like a mail cart, but it was loaded with like every USB device that they could get their hands on. So it had like a US, it had, you know, a USB mouse, USB keyboard. In fact, we'll have like three USB mice and four USB keyboards and, you know, maybe a, and a USB connected printer and some, you know, USB everything. And it all they were all connected together on this office cart, connected through, of course, a whole bunch of USB hubs um, set to like all set to the maximum. So I think at the time USB had a limit, the USB limit was 64 devices. So it's like, okay, let's go get 64 things and like put them on this cart, plug them into... Uh, and it's like, oh, and the USB spec says, oh, uh, you can, you can, you can daisy chain hubs up to three deep. It's like, okay, we're going to daisy chain hubs up to three deep. And so this is, and so this is, it was nicknamed the USB cart of death because it was just this cart loaded with crazy USB devices. Um, in order to help maneuver this cart, one of the USB devices was a USB gaming steering wheel, which was attached to the front. So you could actually drive this cart down the hallway. Uh, and it was called, and, and the way you used the USB cart of death was you walked up, well, you, you drove up using the steering wheel. You drove up to the office of a developer on the kernel team who was working on USB. And you said, hi, do you have a test machine? Yeah. Can I plug something into it? And they'd be like, um, maybe. And you plug, and everything funneled into just one plug. So you plug that one plug into the test machine. The entire USB infrastructure would go crazy because it's just like, oh my goodness, I see 64 new machines connected through hubs three deep and all this other stuff. And depending on how you felt, if you were the person driving the cart, you might just like sit and wait for the entire USB system to settle down and then like try typing on the keyboard, see if the keyboard works, play with the mouse, you know, see if the, see if the steering wheel works in some game. If you were feeling rude, what you would do is you would plug it in. Watch the watch the plug and play system enumerate the devices and start loading drivers for them, and then yank the plug right in the middle, um, and then watch the USB system frantically recover from devices disappearing while it was in the middle of installing them. And so this was the card of death because the usual result of this uh, was a blue screen, right? Um, because you know all this code was just like fresh out of the oven, and so this thing found like 
race conditions and all sorts of, you know, unhandled air conditions. And, and you could just walk into a lab, like the USB testing lab, just have a whole row of machines and just use this one thing, the USB card of death. Plug in, yank it, at a, you know, count to five, yank it. Move on to the next machine, plug it in, count to seven, yank it. Move on to the next machine, count to seven again, yank it. Oh, crash in a different way, how about that? Um, and so you could just have every morning an entire bank of machines that have all crashed waiting for developers, ready for developers to come in and debug and figure out what went wrong so that way it wouldn't crash next time. And it wouldn't crash next time the same way. You would, they'd say, yes, we fixed that bug and that's great. Let me do it. I yank it. Yes, congratulations. It crashed for a different reason. And eventually you could, the goal was to get it to a point where you could plug in the USB card of death, unplug it anytime you wanted, and everything would still work. And I think they made it. Eventually, yeah. I don't remember yeah. it crashed during the or the uh, Bill G keynote, keynote. Chris Capicello was on stage with Bill and they were doing a scanner into Win95 and I think it blue screened under the Yeah, that USB was, that stack. was uh, I believe that was showing USB support in Windows 98. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, and so that it was a beta either way. I know. Yeah, that, and that that predated the card of death. The card of death may have been inspired by it. Maybe it, it was like we want to make sure this doesn't happen again. <laughs> Do you have any examples of people using features in ways that were not intended? Yeah. So one of the things we learned when porting from thirty two bit thirty two bit Windows sixty four bit Windows doing all the porting um, was that data data is like weeds. Like, if there is a place you can hide data, some data will hide there. Uh, so, for example, oh, uh, here's, uh, we, we have some storage for you to store uh, the, like, uh, a window handle. You're supposed to store a window handle here. But people are like, really? I'm supposed to put a window handle here? What if I just put a 32-bit pointer in there? It was like, as long as I promise never to actually call the thing that uses it as if it were a window handle, you won't even notice that I put something that wasn't a window handle there. And so people just find ways of like hiding data in places that were never intended to hold that kind of data. Um, and so when we were doing our port from 32-bit to 64-bit, we would say, oh, here's a 32-bit value. That's great. Um, it's supposed to be a window handle. Good. Put a window handle in there. And then we'd run some program and it would crash because they're like, yes, it's big enough to hold a window handle. But since I never use, I never call any of the functions that need the window handle, I'm going to put a pointer in there. And then later on, and since I'm 32-bit code, that 32-bit pointer fits in the, fits in the 32-bit data. And then later on, I'm going to pull out that data, say, hey, can you give me my window handle? And the system is like, yeah, here's your 32-bit window handle. And we're like, thanks. And then cast it to a pointer and then use it as a pointer again. Um, and this works as long as your pointer is the same size as a window handle. Um, but if you found, so maybe window handle was a bad example because window handles also grew to 64 bits. But if it was just like a 32-bit integer, you jam a pointer into a 32-bit integer, when you port to 64-bit code, that's now a 64-bit pointer. It doesn't fit into a 32-bit integer. Parts of it get lopped off. You read the value out, you cast it back to an integer, you try to use it, and you crash. And so there were a lot of places where we had to go in and say, OK, here's a place where it was supposed to be a small integer, probably no more than 100. But people learned that, well, I could put any 32-bit number in here. I'm going to put a pointer. And so we're like, OK. This is now a 64-bit integer, not expected to be more than 100. <laughs> um, for those of you who like to put things in here that were not small integers. Uh, and so uh, that's just one of, the, one of the things I learned is that if there's a way to abuse storage, it will be abused. A few weeks ago, I had Dave Cutler here. Did you ever work with Dave or meet him at Microsoft? I never met Dave Cutler, um, but I did receive one very angry email from him once. Um, which I guess for most people is the maximum interaction you want with Dave Cutler. In fact, you maybe the wish is you, if you're lucky, you never have to interact with Dave Cutler, um, at least not when he's sending you an angry email. It was in response to a blog post that I that I wrote talking about NTFS compression. And I mentioned that 
the compression algorithm had to be scaled back in order to accommodate some weaknesses in the Alpha AXP instruction set. And he wrote me a very angry letter saying that this is absolutely not true and uh, I should have my journalism license revoked. Um, and I didn't want to tell him I didn't have a journalism <laughs> license. Um, and so I subsequently issued a retraction on, uh, on that article. Uh, the information, uh, the, I guess the, uh, the way you would describe this is with my, my information was poorly sourced. Um, that's what I'm, at least that's what, that's my excuse. My apologies to Dave Cutler. Uh, he apparently is a better source. <laughs> Did you ever, uh, run into Bill Gates? I have actually never met Bill Gates. The closest I got to meeting Bill Gates was when he was making the rounds of our team and selected people were, were given, uh, you know, he is basically everybody, we we're going to put on a little dog and pony show where he would walk around to people's offices and casually drop in on them and ask them what they were doing. But of course, everybody knew that he was coming and would have a whole, a whole presentation prepared for him. Um, but all, but the, the, um, the conceit was that he was just doing a little walk around, just checking on things. Uh, and so one of my colleagues was was chosen to be one of the people that Bill just casually dropped in on. So he had he had a demo all lined up and ready, and he had like a little script for himself, so he knew what steps to go through on the demo. And Bill comes in, says, "Hi, hi, come on in, have a seat." And uh, Bill sits down, and he inadvertently sits down on the sheet of paper that my colleague had written down all of his notes on how to run the demo. Um, and at that point, he just sort of like quietly panicked inside and tried to run the demo as best he could from memory. And he didn't lose his job, so I guess the demo went off well enough. Um, so I guess the answer is don't leave your, your important cheat sheet somewhere that the boss can sit on it. There you go. Did you have anything to do with Windows Power Toys? Do you know the origin of the Power Toys? The Windows Power Toys, they come out in the Windows 95 era. They were originally, um, so there was this period of time after Windows 95 was released to manufacturing. So this is when like we, back when this was a thing, we had an official CD and it's like we threw some ceremony we deliver the CD to our manufacturing facility and there's a big party. And at that point, you can't make any more changes to the product because they're going to be like stamping out billions of copies of it, putting them in boxes and everything. And so the, what was left for the team to do at this point, the testers on the team were going crazy. It was like, okay, we're like, we have like three months before the machine hits retail, the retail floor. And so the test team was going nuts, just like running every test that they could, just running them over and over again, making sure that there were no like killer bugs lurking in the product that would force a recall. Um, the development team, on the other hand, had plenty of time on their hands because it's like, I, I can't write code. If I write, it, it's too late to write code. Right. It's already done. And so we played a lot of Doom. Um, we, uh, we and of course, every so often, one of the testers would find something, a test would fail, and they'd be like, there's something went wrong with this test. It's like, can, can they look at it? It's like, oh, okay, fine, hang on. Sorry, guys, I got to drop out of this multiplayer game, got to go look at a bug. Okay, fine. Um, and then you'd look at it, and you might say, it's like, oh, yeah, that's a real bug. We'll have to write a knowledge base article to advise users on how to work around it, because there's no way we can actually fix it. Like the CDs are already being manufactured. So the best we can do is to document it, um, you know, and uh, provide information so that way the product support people. When people call in with this problem, they can type in the symptoms and the article will come up and they'll walk people through fixing it. Um, but one of the other things when you, were got, when you got tired of playing video games was you would just like write fun little programs. And, and so the power toys emerged the original set of power toys emerged from uh, the development team themselves who just like wrote fun little things. Uh, some of them were actually written during the development of Windows 95 as a way of like validating that the architecture worked. So some of them were like shell extensions 
And so I was like, well, in order to validate that our shell extension architecture works, we should write some shell extensions. Right. And so I was like, oh, I'll write a shell extension for for you know controlling your CD player. Or I'll write a, I'm gonna write a shell extension for like doing a way to copy files to another folder quickly or something. And so everybody just you know came up with these cute little cute little things, and uh, we just gathered them together, put it you know put them in a box, called it the Windows Power Toys, and 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 sent them out. Um, and one of the one of the toys was was mine, which I called Tweak UI, which was just a little program that gave you access to some additional settings that were not included in the control panel. So, you know, things like controlling how quickly the menu uh, ling or how long the menu lingers after your mouse moves out of it, or how how quickly the menu opens after your mouse moves into it. Because you if you're if you're naive and you make the window dismiss the moment the mouse leaves and open the moment the mouse enters, using the mouse turns into one of those mouse dexterity games that you find on the internet where it's like, hey, I built a maze. Use your mouse to move the dot through the maze. And if you touch a wall, you die. And if you don't add these little delays to your mouse interface, then trying to click on an item on the menu turns into one of these little maze games because you have to move up straight up and move straight to the right and then move exactly perfectly straight down. Otherwise, the menu is going to dismiss and you get mad. Anyway, so there were some settings for controlling some of these delays and, and of various, other, uh, various other attributes of the system, but there was no interface for them in the control panel. And so Tweak UI was just my cute little program. It was like, hey, here's some extra settings that you can control too. And somehow Tweak UI like turned into its own like mini cottage industry. Like it developed like 12 tabs and like 5 million settings. Is it still around? Is it still produced? Nah, uh, it, it's, well, we'll get there. Okay. So, and so sometimes teams would actually come to me and say, so we've got some requests from customers to be able to control the setting because we, and there's a way to do it. Like there's a knowledge base article that says how to do it, but it's really frustrating because a lot of them are not, you know, all that technically inclined. Um, so could you just add another tab, like tab number 14 <laughs> to tweak UI for these extra settings? So that way, when our customer, a customer calls in and says, Hey, I need to do this thing. We say, Oh yeah, just download this program, go to tab 14. The, there's a setting for it. So tweak UI sort of became a product support tool, okay. but on the other hand, it became the anti-product support tool. Uh, windows, I think windows 98 included tweak UI in the bonus content on the CD. Um, but in like future releases, it was taken out because what would happen was people would find it in the bonus content of the CD and they'd run it. And it's like, whoa, this is really cool. And they'd just like go nuts checking stuff. Uh, and then their system would like start acting really weird. Right. Uh, because they just went off and just checked random stuff. And then they wonder, it's like, hey, my mouse doesn't work anymore. It's like, well, yeah, because you set the mouse sensitivity to 20 million. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so product support actually asked us to take it off the CD because they were getting uh, a large number of calls from people with some problem. And after working with them to solve it, they realized that, oh, they ran Tweak UI, went berserk, forgot about it, and now they have this problem. And so Tweak UI disappeared from the CD and went back to a download only thing with the theory being that uh, if it's an explicit download, you have to have made a conscious effort to get it. Right. And therefore there, and so it puts some barrier to entry. Like your, your low confidence user is not going to go download this thing from a Microsoft website and run it. Like they're, they're happy. They know how to go to a Microsoft website. And so it sort of created a, a small, but meaningful barrier to entry to messing up your machine. Uh, the power toys then, spun off a separate family of tools called the kernel toys, which were a much lower level set of tools for managing things like uh, configuring your conventional memory. This was all very, these are all very Windows 95-y things that nobody cares about anymore. 
um, or or doing uh, collecting some timing information on how your system is booting. Uh, and there, I think there was a time zone editor that was put in there too. Uh, and the secret, the the secret for the the secret story of the kernel toys is that I basically wrote all of them. Like they were all just my little kernel things, and I just packaged them together and say, here here you go. I guess we can put this thing up for download too. Uh, and I wrote I wrote the weird blurb that talked that talked about all the kernel. You know, it's like, oh, here are the kernel toys that do these things and. My 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 proudest moment in with the kernel toys was the joke in the kernel toys read me that said, please don't expect to see a uh, very very polished UI because these people do their taxes in hexadecimal. The power toys finally stopped being published. Um, I forget exactly. I think it was like Windows XP era was still around and then it it sort of faded out. Uh, part of it was due to a general company policy that we, by policy, we no longer make things for, available for download that are unsupported. Like that okay. sort of, and that's a reasonable policy. It's like, why would we make something available for download and then not support it? If it's not supported, we just shouldn't have it. Right. And so the power toys were one of the casualties of that. Okay. Um, the, however, the name power toys returned. Um, Clint Rutkus sort of recycled the name Power Toys. And there is, if you search for Windows Power Toys, they're back. Uh, it's an open source project now. There's, it's, okay. a, it's in a GitHub repo and it it's not mine anymore. Like Clint and his pals, like they go off and they write all sorts of cool stuff. It sort of fits a similar, serves a similar purpose. Like a lot of the things in there are tools that developers themselves wrote and thought were useful enough to share with others. Like Fancy Zones was written by one of my colleagues because um, he has a very large monitor and he wrote this thing to help him position Windows on his very large monitor. And and the Power Toys people were like, wow, that's really cool. Can we ship it? And he's like, yeah, sure, here you go. Um, I did contribute one Power Toy or one tool to the Power, to the power Toys, which is the Find My Mouse tool. Um, this is a thing where if you're running it and you tap the control key twice, a spotlight zooms in on wherever your mouse is so okay. you can move it around. Because as your as monitors get bigger, uh, it becomes harder and harder to find where your mouse is. Right. Because it's like, okay, you look at your monitor over here, you wiggle your mouse like crazy, and you don't see anything because it's on that part of the screen way over there. And so if a spotlight zooms in on it, that sort of draws your attention. So, right. This it's like it's like that that uh, that meme thing where it's like you know nobody move a muscle it's uh, it tracks things based on movement right right so back in the days of AppCompat and Windows ninety five tell me about the big trip to Egghead ah yes the big trip to Egghead so the development manager for the overall Windows ninety five project he was he was a very clever man who often took unconventional approaches to uh, problem solving. And for the app compatibility, for the issue of like, okay, we need to make sure that Windows 95 has maximum compatibility with existing Windows 3.1 apps. So he took his pickup truck, drove down to the local Egghead, which if you don't know, Egghead was a store that sold computer software. Those things actually existed. Like it was an actual store. You walked into it, and there were rows of shelves of software everything. on it. I'm pretty sure none of those stores really exist anymore. Um, they're they're like now the corner of like an office supply store or something. Um, but at the time, there were actual businesses completely dedicated to selling boxes of software. So he drove his pickup truck down to the Egghead, walked into the store, and said, "I would like one of everything." And they're like, uh, what are you talking about? It's like, I would like to buy one copy of every PC software product, product that you have on your shelves. And they're like, really? It's like, yes. It's like, okay. And the, he just loaded up his pickup truck with one, one box from every product in the store. I'm sure this completely like, you know, 
completely messed up all of their ordering from that store. First of all, that store was probably very, very happy because they hit their quotas for like three years in one day. And well, maybe not three years, but they did a really good job. But it probably also messed up the, all the predictive ordering. He's like, oh, you sell this much last month? Let me go reorder like twice as much for right, next month. Right. <laughs> um, but he returned. It's like, not my problem. That's Egghead's problem. He returns to the to the Microsoft offices with his pickup loaded with software, unloads all the software onto tables in the cafeteria, and calls everybody in, calls in the entire dev team, the developers, testers, everybody, and says, I just have I just bought a piece, one piece of software, one of everything from Egghead. Every you know, every product is represented here. You can go in and like pick a piece of software and adopt it. It is yours. The expectation is that you will install it, test it, file bugs. If you do a good job, you can keep it. And so all of a sudden it became like a flea market. Like everybody was just walking down up and down the aisles, it's like, oh, what did you get? You know, it's like, oh, did you find anything good? Uh, I'm still looking. Um, and you know, you you come out with your piece of software, you take it back back to your office, and you know, you install it, run it, uh, file bugs against it. The uh, games were, of course, a very popular genre, and so and most games at that time were DOS based games. They were not Windows based games. And so me. MS-DOS compatibility guy, bugs ended up mostly landing on my plate. Uh, and so I spent a very large chunk of my time in the Windows 95 project doing application compatibility for games. And some of them were like really interesting. There was one game I remember, there was a bug that only manifested after you'd been playing the game to like level 27. It was like, it was one of the wing commanders, I believe. Because when you finally get it to level 27, you, you, you get a cloaking device. And the bug was, play the game until level 27, until you get the cloaking device. Start a mission, press the key to activate the cloaking device. The result is no cloaking device. So you can't pass the mission because you need that cloaking device to pass the mission. Fortunately, he included a save game because there was no way I was right. going to play that thing for 40 <laughs> hours to get to level 27. Um, and I figured it out. The problem was that the hotkey for the cloaking device was control C. And so that conflicted with the existing code in the MS-DOS emulation layer that, d that, did, um, that treated control C as a cancel key for if you pasted a large amount of text. So if you had a large amount of text in the clipboard and you hit paste, we would manually simulate keyboard activity to type all those letters into the keyboard. And if you hit control C, we would stop. And the problem was that the control C that you hit was being interpreted as a stop pasting text and the app never got to see it. Right. So it got eaten. It got eaten. And so I was like, yep, this is a real bug. Uh, so I added some stuff. And so now it's like, oh, we will only honor that hotkey if a paste is active. Um, because while it was the case, we, it, it, it used to be when you hit the key, we would recognize it. We would say, oh, I'm sorry, paste is not active. We didn't actually eat the key. What we did is we replayed the key back into the app. So we would say, okay, control key down, C down, C up, control key up. The problem is that our replay was too fast. So we would replay the key, but the app would not check the keyboard fast enough. And so it would never see the key get pressed, right? We'd, we'd say key down. He would say, is the key down? No. And then we would press the key and release it. And he would say, how about now? No. And so it would never actually see the, the cloaking command being activated. And so, yeah. And so the solution was just completely ignore the hotkey sequence if a paste is not active. So then the key went in at human speeds and then the app could see it. Uh, race conditions were a very common source of problems because when you're running in a multitasking operating system, um, 
the app is no longer getting 100% of the CPU. Uh, and so it's like, yeah, I learned that I can do exactly 500 of these things a second. And well, but now if you're multitasking with Excel, you can only do 250 of them a second. And then maybe in a couple of minutes, you can only do 100 of them a second. Um, and so you would often get into apps that ran into uh, ran into trouble because things weren't happening at the at the speed that they were expecting. They were happening too fast or too slow. Like in this case, a keyboard sequence, we would replay a key sequence too fast, and and it wouldn't see it. Sometimes we would. Um, like if, if an app was not getting enough CPU time, we'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry, you didn't get enough CPU time. Here, we'll give you some CPU time to let you catch up. Uh, three timer ticks happened and you missed them. So I'm gonna give you three timer, tick happens in, three timer ticks in a row, bang, bang, bang. And it would happen too quickly because he always thought in between timer ticks, I can always get a frame out because the timer tick runs at like, you know, whatever it is, 57 milliseconds. And I need to get a frame at every 15, 16 milliseconds. So clearly I can get like two frames out. So, but if we just push two timer ticks in, bang, bang, then he couldn't get a frame out, divide by zero somewhere or something terrible would happen. Is there a particular piece of code or feature you look back on now that gives you immense satisfaction that you've written in the past in particular? There's a, a couple of things that, that, I'm, that I'm proud of, although not necessarily because they were complicated. Like the one thing, one feature that I was most proud of for a long time was that I fixed pinball. It, it's always pinball. I fixed pinball so it didn't consume 100% CPU. So oh, I wanted 1,000 frames per second. <laughs> yeah, so it was often the case, it's like, oh, you kick off a build, you got some time to kill, I'll play a little pinball. You know, when the build is done, then I can go and continue and, do my development work. But the problem was that pinball was written for Windows 95. It ran at 100%, it pegged a core, it ran 100% CPU because back in the day, like if you ran Windows 95 as fast as possible on the processors of the day, it could just about keep up its frame rate. But in the meantime, processors got faster and faster. Um, and so, I went to figure out like, okay, what is, why is it taking so much CPU? And I realized that it had no frame rate limiter. It just rendered frames as fast as it could. And for fun, I found that there was some debug code to print the frame rate in the upper right hand corner of the screen. So I turned it on, rebuilt it, ran it. It just showed asterisks. And that's because it only included a two or three digit field for the frame rate, but the actual frame rate now the computers had gotten so much faster was like, it was generating like a million frames a second. And so it clearly didn't fit. And my solution was, oh, I'll just add a frame rate limiter. I will just say, you know what? If you're at a hundred frames a second, I think that's good enough. You can, you can, you can take a break, take a break, come back when it's time for another frame in another 10 milliseconds. And once I added a frame rate limiter of 100 frames a second, the CPU usage just plummeted to like 1% or something. And um, so that for me, that was my, my proudest moment in Windows development was I fixed pinball so it, it, you could kick off a build and play pinball at the same time. Uh, in terms of, now mind you, that was not very technically difficult, but it gave me great satisfaction. Something that I, I'm more proud of from a technical standpoint is that um, there is a debugger called the time travel debugger. Um, this is a debugger that what you do is you run your program under the time travel debugger and it captures a trace of your program. So it records every single instruction that your program executes. Um, when it, if you're, if you execute a read instruction, it remembers what memory was read. If you execute a write instruction, it says, okay, good job. That's the memory that was written. Uh, and when it makes this recording of your, of, of what your program did, you can then load the recording back into the debugger and replay it. And the great thing about this is since it is completely reproducing what happened last time, when you're doing normal debugging, sometimes you'll be like, okay, I'm going to set a breakpoint. You do some debugging. It's like, ah, oh, I messed up. 
what do you have to do? You have to start the program over, try to get back, re get to the original conditions, set the breakpoint again, try to debug it again. And often getting the program into the state where you want to debug it takes far more time than the actual debugging you want to do. Um, but with time travel debugging, it's already recorded. So you can just say, oh, go to you know time point so-and-so in the recording, and then you can just start your debugging from there. And if something went wrong, you're like, oh, okay, it's a it's a recording. So you can just say, oh, execute backwards, go backwards in time, you know, reverse step backwards. And okay, I'm gonna step forwards again and pay closer attention to something. So it, it's it's a really fantastic tool for for debugging uh, these uh, these types of problems where setting up the problem takes a really long time. Right. Uh, often, often the problem might be like, oh, there's a, I, I found a memory corruption. I found the code that's, that's, you know, corrupting the memory who freed this pointer. And you don't, you can't set a breakpoint ahead of time. You don't even know where this breakpoint for the bad free is. But if you have a recording, you can go, you know, hit the point where it's like, oh, here's where we use the bad pointer and then execute backwards to look to see who freed that pointer, right? So you can you have like the benefit of clairvoyance or hindsight, depending on how you're looking at it. Anyway, that's a very long setup for the fact that one of the things I was, I worked with, I did some, made some contributions to the time travel debugging code. And one of the things I did was in the code that does the replay, the replay is actually done by jitting the, simulation the the simulated ex instructions that were previously executed um you can even make a recording on an arm and replay it on an x64 machine because we can replay arm instructions like basically there's like a tiny little arm emulator inside the time travel debugger that's like single stepping an arm but it's really not single stepping an arm it's uh, the great thing is time travel debugging is actually done in microcode when you execute an ARM instruction, it actually breaks it down into like three little microcode instructions and records those, those microcode instructions. And so then the replay happens. And so I did a little work in the jitter that takes those microcode instructions and regenerates x64 code to execute those microcode instructions. And I wrote a couple of the jitters for some of the, for some of the microcode instructions. Um, but I also wrote the register allocator for the jitter, and I was very, very proud of that. So that was a very long story to say, I wrote a register allocator for a jitter. I'm so happy. <laughs> I'd be happy to. Back in the old days, one time, I colored uh, compressed files blue and encrypted files green. I still argue that's a good idea when it's not the only indication. Um, of course, explain why it's actually a bad idea and what they're doing with it now, because I think they've taken that feature away. Yeah, could, so yeah, there was a time when compressed files were blue, was it compressed blue and encrypted green? Yeah. The problem with that, of course, is that uh, there are people who have <laughs> different types of color blindness uh, where those color, colors like are not distinguishable. Um, and so this is one of the things you always have to pay attention to when you're doing user interface work that involves colors you have to be conscious of the fact that there are people who have uh, uh, visual visual processing or their their problems with color processing in the eye. Either it doesn't pick up on it, or the brain has trouble processing the colors. Uh, and so you can't have color be the sole indicator of any particular piece of information. Uh, and so I I actually don't know what we do now. To indicate that a file is in, is encrypted or compressed, I think we just don't indicate anything. Uh, but if you go to the properties, it'll be listed as whether it's uh, compressed or encrypted. Uh, fortunately, we don't have the problem of trying to show something in two colors at once because a file cannot be both compressed and encrypted. Right. Um, otherwise, we would have to figure out how to do a checkerboard pattern or, or aqua or aqua <laughs> green and blue. That's mixed. right. For, for and and now there's like oh another another category of color blindness can no longer use our product. All right, I got a question in three parts. Uh oh, number one: Have you ever watched a usability test where they bring in subjects to test out and try features? Number two: If so, did it trigger rage, sadness, or both? And number three: What would be the German word for both at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I have observed uh, usability studies. This is. 
the setup that we had was we had the subject who was in a room with a computer. And of course, you know, there's a camera recording them. And we are in the room next door that can see in, but they can't see us because it's a one way, a one way, one way glass. Um, and, you know, we would ask them to perform what we thought was a simple task. And of course, the user would struggle with it. Install the printer driver. Yeah. I think actually one of the one of one of the tasks we asked them was, "Here's a document. Print it." And they had managed to open the document in in Word or WordPad or something, whatever the program was. And they were looking at the toolbar. It's like, okay, one of these must be print for printing. Um, this was back when toolbars were the cool UI. Uh, thing is like, hey, we put a toolbar in. We'll see if that helps people find how to print things. So they found the toolbar. We're like, yes, toolbar is working. They're looking at the toolbar and they look at it and they're like, no, no, no. They mouse to the picture of the printer. The mouse lingers on it for like two seconds and they say no. And then they keep moving and like, no, bold face, no. And like they had, were right there. It was a picture of a printer. Didn't occur to them. That was how you print. And so watching this game or watching a usability study to me is like being an audience member at a game show where there's a contestant up on stage and they have to like guess the price of something. And you're like saying higher, higher, higher. No, no, stop, stop, stop. And you're like screaming at them, trying to get them because you know the answer and they don't. And the usability researcher actually had to tell us to keep it down. It's like, they can still hear you. Can you like not yell at them? Um, and so it is a combination of, what was it? Frustration. Rage and sadness. I have. Frustration, <laughs> rage and sadness. The German word for that. Uh, I, I do not know. My, my, currently my favorite German word, however, is verschlimmbessern, which is a combination of the verb verschlimmern, which means to make worse and verbessern, which means to make better. And so for Schlimmbessern is to make something worse in a well-intentioned but misguided attempt to make it better. There, I fixed it. Yes. There. Yes. It's the there, I fixed it. <laughs> there is a perception that 16-bit Windows is really just a shell running on top of MS-DOS. Can you explain why that's not the case and what makes 16-bit Windows a real operating system? Actually, it is. <laughs> well, Windows 286 and 386, once you're kicked into protected mode, that was something Yeah, but that's not did. what we were talking about. Oh, that's, that's what I was talking about. I'm ah, sorry. Right. Yeah, so I can't remember. I think it was Windows 2.0 that added support for the 386. I think so. It was Windows, yeah, that added enhanced mode. And so what happened was there are actually two operating systems running. Um, the, window, the Windows 386, which was the internal name for this component, was running a 32-bit operating system. It was a 32-bit multitasking operating system with multiple virtual machines. Um, and inside one of the virtual machines was a copy of 16-bit Windows. And so 16-bit Windows was like running as a program in a virtual machine. And the other virtual machines were used to run your MS-DOS programs. Um, and so you were really running like three operating systems at once. There was the, the uh, Win386, the virtual machine manager, which uh, was managing all the virtual machines, providing virtual services like simulated keyboards, simulated timers, um, negotiating who had access to the video card, that sort of thing. And then one of, and then inside one of the inside one of the virtual machines was a copy of Windows, the GUI Windows. And then inside the other virtual machines was running a copy of MS DOS. Uh, and so you actually were running three operating systems all at once. And with the virtual machine manager, like being the, the main one that's sort of negotiating who gets access to what. Um, but even in that case with Windows 95, Windows 95 took it even further. It, it started, I think, in Windows 3.11 with uh, Windows for Workgroups, uh, where the file system was taken out of 16-bit code and was written in as a 32-bit device driver. So when... A program in the running in the virtual machine, either 16-bit Windows or uh, MS-DOS program, accessed the disk. The the disk I/O operation 
the, the file I.O. operation was trapped and handled it up in 32-bit mode, and all of the file system code ran in 32-bit mode, and then the results were given back to you in, it was returned to the original application, which meant that, like, even though you had to, you started your computer running MS-DOS, and then you ran Windows, the Windows you ran actually first ran Win386, which sort of put the original copy of MS-DOS to sleep, just took over the operations from it, and then ran uh, Windows and MS-DOS sessions. And so the original copy of MS-DOS was like not really running anymore. It was just lying around. Uh, and so you really, you really didn't have MS-DOS running the show anymore, although everybody thought it did because that's, that's what booted the system. But really, right. MS-DOS was just being used as a bootloader. Tell that actually, story. we should actually, actually remember you did the thing about the uh, Janet Jackson. You you like did. did your own experiment on it, and then um, did you see the the video that Adam Neely put out about? Um, Is that the musical guy? Yeah, yeah, he did a really nice job on yeah, that. Yeah, he did a really. He even found a paper that like looked for like what is the resonant frequency of a hard drive. And I'm like, hey, it's right there. That was cool. Yeah, he took it one step further. It was really cool. Mm -hmm. In the Win in the Win32 window manager, there is a mouse enter leave, or there is a mouse leave, but there's no mouse enter. Yeah, yeah wh wh where's mouse enter? Yeah, why do you only have one? What's up with that? How would well, you ever possibly know? How would you know? Well, because the the mouse move message acts as a mouse enter, because when the mouse moves over your window, you get a mouse move message. And so you can just keep track. The first mouse move message you get after a mouse leave must have been a mouse enter. Right. It's so you set a flag. It's and... a sneaky trick. <laughs> what about long file names? Any uh, heartache come from those when they were first introduced? Doing compatibility with the short file names and the tombstones and having files come back. It seems like there must have been a fair bit of... I do remember uh, one of the decisions that was made when we were designing long file names was that the long file names would be stored in Unicode. And this was a controversial decision at the time because Unicode is like, dude, that's like take, gonna take up twice as much space as regular characters. Like, who would that's gonna waste so much disk space? But the but the the the, the engineers who designed is like, trust me, trust me, you're gonna you're gonna be happy you had Unicode. And it turns out, yeah, that was a that was a good call. Yeah, I remember with the shell idols, I was doing the MIPS porting, and I realized that ITLs can be an arbitrary number of bytes long because you can have an ANSI string in there. So if you've got a 17-byte string, your next idealist is not 32-bit aligned. So I was trying to make the case for at least let's 32-bit aligned PIDLs or 16-bit aligned text or something, but every instruction that touches anything within an ITL is, is wrapped inside of a try except now to watch for, or it was at one time, I should say. Yeah, the, so yeah, so ITLs with... We're, we're talking shop here. Uh, it'll's ID lists. This is a... Uh, it's like a path, but for the shell. Yeah, it's it's the way that items in the shell are represented. And it is a binary format, variable length, just like paths. Um, and so, yes, there was no restriction on... There was no requirement that each component, that each it'll component was an even number of bytes. And so in practice, they, they could be any any size. And yeah, this, this caused problems on basically every processor that wasn't an x86. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, because RISC processors were, in the days, not very friendly to misaligned memory accesses. And in particular, uh, trying to load misaligned memory was... Like if even if you knew ahead of time that the memory was misaligned, loading a value from an address that is misaligned takes a lot more work than loading memory from an aligned address. Uh, so, yeah, I think loading a thirty-two bit word is pull a byte, shift, pull a byte, or pull a byte word in. You have to build yeah, up a thirty-two. Yeah, like depending on the processor, some of them had like I, I there was one that had like load load left load right where you could say. Hey, here's a misaligned address. Could you just like load the part that you can into this part, into, into whatever part matches? And so it would, in the easy case, there were some processors where it would only double the number of instructions it took to load a misaligned word. 
Um, but then there were processors like the Alpha AXP, where it took like eight instructions to load a misaligned, a misaligned word. Um, and, and if you guessed wrong, you thought the pointer was aligned, but it turns out it was misaligned, depending on the processor, it might take a fault, which is going to cost you like a billion instructions because now you trap into the kernel. The kernel goes in and says, oh, I see what you're trying to do. Okay, let me do those eight instructions for you and then resume. Um, but you really should have done those eight instructions yourself because now you're paying a kernel trap and everything. So it ended up costing you thousands of instructions. Um, or if you're really unlucky, the processor would just say, um, look, you were supposed to pass aligned addresses. So I'm just like going to ignore the bottom two bits of the address and assume it was aligned. And you you just like, congratulations, you loaded a value from the wrong address. <laughs> and so, yeah, so um, misaligned data is very unfriendly to risk processors. Nowadays, it's gotten a little better. Uh, a lot of them nowadays can handle misaligned addresses. Uh, they fix it up internally within the chip, so the cost is not so bad. Um, but still, you probably shouldn't shouldn't rely on it. This is just a random question, but if you have a PC and you've got two video cards and you've got two mice and two keyboards, is there any way to split it into two workstations? That's, other than setting up VMs and passing through video cards to each VM, which you could do. Any way to have two work two Windows stations on a single PC yet? I don't think so. It's probably not a common request, but I'm just curious. Yeah, well, be, yeah, I, I, it, it doesn't work because the input system has a single input queue. And so it can't segregate the, like the input still, the input knows which keyboard it came from. Right. But they still get processed centrally. And, and most of the time, like the information about which keyboard it came from is kept with the, with the key press but nobody cares um, unless you use like the special raw input API, which does let you query which keyboard produced this key, um, but no apps care about it. And the window manager itself doesn't use it for routing. Okay. So sorry, it didn't help. There were the, also the game developers who thanked me for going insane. Did you go insane? Maybe. Or so this, when, when the stories went around of all the work that I had done to get video games working in Windows 95, uh, some developers, uh, video game developers, who were visiting Microsoft because this other project called DirectX was getting off the ground. And so they were coming in and, you know, we were having a little, little meeting talking about DirectX and what, it could, what, what features they need from DirectX, that sort of thing. And they heard the story about some developer on the Windows 95 team who got all of their games working in Windows 95, but at a tremendous cost because he went insane. And I received a letter from them containing this email message that said there is this developer who got your, you know, got your all your games to work but went insane. And it it was a printed out letter from the the developers and it just had a handwritten message at the end that said thanks for going insane <laughs> with their signatures and i i have it it's a it, i have that letter framed it's packed up in a box somewhere i have to go find it legend holds that you have an unused vip ticket to the win 95 event launch event yeah so for the windows 95 launch event if you go back and watch the videos fast forward over all the jay leno stuff um, at the end of the at the end of the launch event, they drop the curtain, and the entire product team is up there on the bleachers cheering. And the the plan was to put the product team up there in the bleachers, but there were a few seats available in the tent to watch the to watch the launch as an attendee, and so there was just a lottery within the team and a couple of people were randomly selected. It's like, congratulations, you get a ticket to the tent. And I happened to be one of the people who was lucky enough to get one of these tickets. So I had a ticket to the Windows 95 launch, but one of my colleagues really wanted to go into the tent and see the show. And so I said, fine. So I gave her my ticket. But then 
at the Windows 95 launch, while all of the team, we were, you know, being herded and gathered and prepped to go up onto the bleachers and do our cheering, uh, I saw that she was in the room with us. And I said, what happened? I thought you had, you had a ticket. And she said, yeah. And she handed the ticket back to me and said, but it didn't feel right. I realized that this is being with the rest of the team is, is where I really need to be. And so I have an unused ticket to the Windows 95 launch. Uh, I do not know how many of these tickets still exist. I know there is at least one because the Microsoft Museum has a copy of an unused Windows 95 launch ticket. Although it's not clear to me whether that was a ticket that was issued but never used or just a spare ticket that they saved for archival purposes. Um, meanwhile, I learned that I was talking to some colleagues who worked on the printing, the Windows NT printing team at the time of the Windows 95 launch. Specifically, they worked on printing on like very, very high-end printing, like real, really nice printing, not your like $100 desk printer, but like professional grade printing. So they had access to really, really good printers. They also were able to like catch glimpses or sneak pictures or otherwise learn what the different tickets to the Windows 95 launch all looked like. They created forgeries of the Windows 95 ticket. They used that to get inside. They would walk around. They would see like the staff. They would notice it's like, oh, it's a badge. Like get a quick look at it, make a fake badge. You know, run back to the office, make a fake badge. Now they have this fake badge. They had fakes of like every single badge they could find. They would like come in and they noticed that it's like somebody, somebody's, you know, they would like overhear somebody trying to, trying to get into the, um, trying to get in. And it's like, oh, I misplaced my ticket. The, so it's like, okay, well, let me look for your name on the list, blah, blah, blah. And they learned this like, oh, some people have like a little yellow star sticker on their ID card. And it's like, what does that star sticker do? Oh. Oh, it means that they have access to this other like after party event or something. It's like yellow stickers, get yellow stickers. So they were basically doing one of these like mission impossible type things where they were just doing massive recon, finding out what, you know, what could get you maximum access to every part of the event. And then very quickly manufacturing forgeries of every single pass. So by the end of the day, they had successfully produced forgeries of every single pass they could find. I do not know how many of the events they actually attended. I think part of it was just the challenge. Of yeah, the funds in making the passes. Tell me about the confidential coffee maker. So back in the day, Microsoft and IBM were working together on this product known as OS2. Maybe you heard of it. Um, but, you know, Microsoft, based in Redmond, the IBM offices that were doing OS2 work were in Boca Raton, Florida. And so there was always, uh, there was a small contingent of Microsoft employees who were sent down to stay in Boca uh, and sort of act as, as liaisons between the, the work happening in Boca and the work happening up in Redmond. The rules... Uh, the, the rules for how this was, this arrangement was done was that Microsoft employees, that these people would be rotated through, like nobody would be stuck in Boca for the whole time. You would go down for a few months and then you'd be sent back home and then somebody else would take your place. Um, the problem, there was a, immediately there was a problem because there was a significant culture clash between the Microsoft way of doing things and the IBM way of doing things. The IBM way of doing things was very corporate. You had to, you know, there was a dress code. Uh, the Microsoft way of doing things was, are you wearing pants? Good job. Um, and so, for example, the security regulations down in IBM were much stricter. You would get written up. You would receive a citation if somebody saw for example, a security, you would get a security violation if you beeped yourself into the building and somebody snuck in behind you, right? 
That's a security violation. Unauthorized person enters the building. Uh, you would get a security violation if you left papers on your desk at the end of the day and didn't put them away in a locked cabinet. Because, well, you know, it's okay, fine. Visible, visible documents not in a secure location. You would get a security violation if you wore shorts. Um, I am not quite sure how wearing shorts is a security violation, but nevertheless, that's how they classified it. The rumor was that there were many there were many rumors that circulated regarding these security violations one rumor was that if uh if you received six violations then you would be kicked out and be sent back to redmond uh however somebody reported that this rumor was not true they know this rumor was not true because they tried it and it didn't work um there were other rumors about like, oh, if, if maybe if a total number of violations amassed by all Microsoft employees reach a certain level, then a certain penalty would be imposed. Nobody really understood what, a, what, what actually happened. What actually happened to all of these security violations? Was there just some big box with a huge stack of papers that things just kept going into? Nobody knew. But one of the other things that caused trouble was that Microsoft people from Seattle like coffee. In the Boca Raton offices, there was a vending machine. You could put money in that vending machine, and in exchange, it gave you an undrinkable brown liquid, labeled coffee. Uh, the Microsoft employees were not happy with that sort of undrinkable brown liquid, and so they brought their own coffee maker to work. This was immediately cited as a security violation um, because it was an unauthorized heat generating appliance. Now, there was part of the agreement between Microsoft and IBM that anything labeled Microsoft Confidential was off limits and IBM could not open any box or any envelope labeled Microsoft Confidential. So the Microsoft employees who liked their coffee got a cardboard box cut a door in it large enough to fit a cup of coffee and put the box over the coffee machine and wrote Microsoft Confidential on it. This successfully prevented them from uh, receiving any further security violations for their confidential coffee maker because IBM, by agreement, were not allowed to look inside. Yeah, they were able to wear shorts with impunity. <laughs> I've heard that, yeah, tell, the, tell me the Steve B rental car story. As you might expect, Steve Ballmer, who was head of the operating systems division at the time, would occasionally go down to Boca Raton to sync with his IBM counterparts. There was one time he went down and for some reason, I'm going to make up a story. It's like, hey, we'll all go to, we'll have dinner together. So that he, you know, goes to dinner with a bunch of the other executives and it's like, oh, it's running late. We'll just take you straight to the airport. So Steve just is, goes straight to the airport, flies home to Redmond. Everything is great. Except that he left his rental car in the IBM parking lot. Um, the, there was another employee at IBM who was sort of proud of the fact that he was the first guy into work every day. But now he would come in to the parking lot and there was this other car there. And he's like, who is this other employee who is like really diligent and beating me into work every day? And staying late too. And that car, <laughs> when I leave, he's still there. Like this guy is crazy. He's like working harder than me. I thought I was the hardest working guy at IBM. But in fact, it was not an employee. It was the rental car that Steve B had left in the uh, parking lot. And when the story of the mysterious, hardworking employee got around, Steve realized, he's like, oh, wait, that was my rental car. Um, and presumably uh, had the issue addressed with and had a very large car rental bill to deal with. I once lost my rental car keys on the beach. Ooh, and that's rough. It was. We were having a barbecue or a fire pit out on the beach, and I got lost. And so we searched for hours. Couldn't find them. I was had like an hour and a half to get to my 
airport at this point with the family and I called Amex and I told them and they were like, okay, we're going to send a tow truck to come tow the car and we're going to send a van to come pick up your family and they'll be there in 30 minutes. I'm like, okay, Amex. <laughs> so I was really impressed. But. It's a story that Dave has already told, which is you left your, you left your phone number in the, in the That's code. true. Yeah. Like there was, there was a time like under a particular set of conditions, which I think was like certain numbers didn't add together properly. If like CPU there was, a was greater than a hundred, basically. Oh, if CPU was greater than a hundred. And it would break into the debugger with a message saying, if you see this message, call Dave PL and had your phone number. And it hit. And we're like, should we call Dave? I don't know. <laughs> I, I think we decided not to call you. I've had, I've had one call. You got you one call? You, you actually were out of I think, I think it. I think it actually hit once. Yeah, it turned out to be a kernel accounting bug. And I, you know, I had to prove that it wasn't That my, wasn't you. Yeah. And the onus of proof is pretty high when you're a new app versus the kernels. Right. I was math guy, but I was also like computer hacker guy. Yeah. So I, you know, it's like, I, I, I cut my teeth on the Apple II, Apple II Plus, and like learn assembly language on that thing, disassembling ROMs, patching, patching stuff. It was like, I reverse engineered like we, my dad, he bought a hard drive. Now, this doesn't sound exciting today. In 1985, buying a hard drive was a big deal. That thing was like this big and it held like a hundred floppies. It had storage capacity equivalent to a hundred floppies, it had its own power supply and everything. But the drivers for that hard drive only worked with Apple DOS 3.3 and CPM, but Apple had a new operating system called ProDOS. And it's like, oh, how am I going to get this to work? So I actually like spent way too much time reverse engineering that driver enough so that I could get it to boot into ProDOS. Um, oh, that's right. And, and UCSD Pascal was the other, like it supported three operating systems, Apple DOS, UCSD Pascal, CPM, and I added ProDOS. I still don't know how I managed to pull that off. 6502. Six, it, but it was like, it was like a lot of 6502 assembly that you're just like staring at trying to figure out. Um, which was particularly because the, you know, the 6502 only has 64K of address space. And so in order to get all of their firmware code mapped in, it was bank switched. And so it's like, okay, you capture this bank. And it's like, oh, but then you like turn around and look back. He's like, the bytes are all different. It's like, yeah, somebody bank switched it to something else. Um, so I never really understood enough of it, but I somehow managed to cobble together enough to get it to actually boot into an operating system that they never intended to support. So then I, you know, so clearly I've developed my hardcore reverse engineering hacker right. skills, which meant that it's like, oh, first of all, it's like, dude, you're like comfortable in assembly language. That's really great. So it's like, oh, okay. I got myself an 86 assembly language book, like teach yourself assembly language, IBM PC assembly language. It's like, great. I learned it now. I, now I know IBM PC assembly language. I'm like writing stuff in assembly language because it's fun and because basic is really slow. Um, and probably those were like good enough skills to get me, get me an interview. And I had enough, I had enough just general experience and. And you enjoyed your time working on software as an intern enough that it led you to a different path or was it more glacial or slower than that? Or do you know after your internship? Oh yeah. Yeah. After the, after the internship, I was like, this is more fun than math. Right. Um, but I, but I did get a full scholarship to get a math PhD. So I should at least give it a shot. Um, so, so I went back, did the math thing and then it's like, okay, I'll, that internship was kind of fun. I'm going to do another, I'm going to do another summer internship, even though my scholarship would have paid for me to stay there all through the summer. So I actually probably lost money coming to work for Microsoft for the summer. Right. Um, because you know, a lot of the, the money you get paid, but then a bunch of your money goes back towards housing. And so the amount of money you actually take home was probably less than I would have made just from my stipend. Right. Um, but I enjoyed it a lot more. And, uh, and then I realized like, I'm just going to do this. Like this math thing is not working. 
So it was like I started hitting a wall in math. It turns out math is hard. Um, you may not have noticed this, but math is kind of hard, at least. And so I had enough. I had enough aptitude to get through undergraduate math and early graduate math, and then I hit my wall. I hit that in grade nine. <laughs> <laughs> so I hit my wall. I'm like, ah, oh, I think I've maxed out at math. And it's like it's just not, it's not, not moving forward anymore. But it's like, hey, I got this other thing. So I like, you know, called Ben Slivka, who was my, uh, who who was my. Um, my boss when I was an intern. I didn't know that. He was mine too. Yeah. That's why I came and worked for him as an intern. Yeah. And I said, Hey, um, can I interview for a job? And he's like, sure. And so he set me up a loop. I showed up and the, the loop was much more relaxed than the internship loop because they already like my reputation preceded me. They're like, yeah, yeah, just get this guy. So like the, the interview loop was less like, should we hire this guy? But rather, Let's try to convince this guy to quit graduate school and come to work here. I didn't have that feeling. I did really good as an intern, and I kind of thought, well, I'm a shoo in to come back as an employee because I had such a good internship. But mm -hmm. then the five people you're interviewing with six months later, that's nice what you did six months ago. But, but what, what can you do for me now? Yeah. yeah. And it's, they're different people. It's not the same team. So everybody, you know, was quite fresh, I think. What part of this job keeps you coming back? Yeah. The health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> You'd um, still be debugging things on Cobra. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's like, it's something to do. I mean, part of, part of it is like, I noticed like when my dad retired and he got bored. Yeah, I, I did too. Uh, and, and so it's like, well, it, it, it gives me something to do. It sets a good example for my kids because my kids aren't like, they're not out of college. Like they're still in high school and, you know, middle school. It's like, we need to set the example is like, in order to be a productive member of society, you need to get a job, contribute, make the world a better place. And not like, not like, oh, dad retired early and he sits and plays video games all day. That's what I should do. <laughs> right. I remember uh, asking Mark Z about that a long time ago. Like, why are you still working? And he's because I've got little kids and they need to see me go to work I, every day. I need to set a good example for my kids. Yeah. What did your father do? Uh, my dad was a college professor. He wow. taught mechanical engineering specializing in heat transfer it, it was like during Maybe he could have helped with that talking machine at IBM well he would have he would have told them how what they needed to do to keep that thing from burning up the table um like when I was in when I was in college and I'd come home for Christmas break and I would I would grade my my dad's students papers that is exams he would he was like okay here's the problem like he would basically like in five minutes teach me what it like it took him a semester to right. teach the, kid, the other students because he only had to teach me enough to be able to grade the problem it's like okay you know it's like oh we set up this problem this is the formula to use give them 10 points if they know which formula to use you know give them three points for doing the math right take a point off if they drop a sign you know that sort of thing um but then i would look at the problems and one of and and it's like okay some of these students are like they they they're like following the cookbook, but not understanding the cookbook. Right. And so it would be like, there would be a problem. Like we're in a room. The room is 20 degrees C. There is a pipe carrying hot water that goes across the room and the water is entering at like 90 C. What temperature is the water when it gets to the other end of the pipe? Assuming certain, you know, Flow rate. Very flow rate, insulation characteristics, whatever. And some of the students would come up with answers like, oh, the water temperature is negative 20 degrees. <laughs> I was like, how, <laughs> how can the water freeze well, the formula. on its way across the room? Well, it's because it boils in the middle and then it gets colder <laughs> outside. Which... And then others would say, oh yeah, the water enters at 90, exits at 95. How can it get warmer? The room is only at 20. <laughs> it's, it's like, okay, you guys, you plug numbers in and you probably like drop the sign or something, right? And it's like, oh, the answer says 98 degrees. Must be 98 degrees. It's like, look at the problem. Clearly, it cannot be 98 degrees. Physics tells you 98 degrees is not possible. 
That was one style of interview question that I don't think they do anymore that I always thought was kind of interesting was the how many gas stations in America or how many mm -hmm. of anything and getting right. somebody to estimate and be able to watch them see if they're able to rule out their erroneous and crazy estimates and narrow it down to something predict you know useful. Right. Um, and, and and it's like and the final answer there's still a very wide range of final guesses based on your assumptions. You know, it's like, oh, let's let's assume like, you know, uh, there are average of this many people per family in the United States and every family owes 1.2 cars and, you know, whatever, you, you do the math. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you're just pulling numbers out of your head. So your final answer is going to vary from the next person's. But the question is like, or did you just assume that like every family has five members? It's like, that might be kind of high. Every family has 12 cars. It's kind of high, you know, or it's like you, or you didn't even get to that point. Like, you're just like, how many cars did I see today? Right. It's like, how did you arrive at the number of cars? Yeah. When I left, I, uh, put all my cables in the center of the room. Cause I went through all my drawers and desks and yeah. you know, stuff is mine. I'm taking stuff is theirs. I'm leaving. And I had a massive Big, pile massive, of cables. Yeah. I, I have to go through and, uh, and just let go of some of these uh, of these cables. It's like I did hey, it a couple of years ago. I spread everything on the floor, and I kept you know one of every one, one scuzzy of the, yeah, fifty, yeah, yeah. scuzzy sixty eight. Like, I don't need three of these. Right, exactly. And now it's like I don't need any of these because if I need one, I can just go back to the admin and ask for one. It's like I don't need an HDMI cable. The admin already has boxes of them. If right. I need one, I can just get one. And my spare time is like writing writing more content for the blog. That thing's still going. Uh, yeah. You write quite a bit. Do you know how many words a week you write? I don't know how many words I write, but I, 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 an article goes out every day, every weekday. And you really? still don't have a journalism license. No, no, it's still not my journalism <laughs> license. Um, and so like, and, and I have a buffer. My buffer is now, I finally, I worked hard. I got my buffer back up to six months. So I have a six month. No way. Oh, really? Six month lead of content. In my, in the, in my heyday, I had an 18 month lead. So it's like, I, it, and it was great because then it's like, I just like stop writing for a month, like whatever come back you know it's like an 18 month padding um but it, it went down it got down to like four months and then i just get really really anxious so no, i've got no buffer i've got nothing i got in the nothing queue. like it's all I, going live tonight like i i can go on vac i can go on a vacation to italy i come back and my buffer's all gone well i'm not gonna go to Italy for that long but but i, I worked it back up to six months so i'm like okay six months is like my minimum you know that minimum bang. if it drops below six the anxiety really cranks up but I want to I want to try to push it up, try to get it to like seven, eight months, just nine months. Nine would be great. This is this is like very strange. Most people don't have that much that much front loaded. Content. No, they certainly don't. But it's it, it's it's like it's like TV shows where they're like, yeah, we're filming this week for an episode oh. that's going out two weeks from now. What we're probably or what comes to mind as the most challenging backwards compatibility thing you had to fix for win 95. Is there anything that stands out? Well, there, I, I remember there, there are a whole bunch of just really bad things that programs did. Um, a very common thing that games did was when they started up, they just tried to allocate all the memory they could just keep allocating memory until it fails. Uh, and this works if you're running an MS DOS where you're not competing against everybody, anybody else. And there's no virtual memory. So it's like, yeah, oh, you're, if you're on a, a four megabyte machine, you just allocate memory. After four megabytes, it stops allocating. You're like, okay, I guess I have four megabytes. But Windows 95 had virtual memory. And so what, what happened is initially when we started you know, doing the testing, you'd run these programs and the program would start up and then your hard drive would just start going crazy. And then the program finally... Uh, you know, finished whatever it was doing and then it crashed because what was going on is it was allocating all the memory that it could. But since Windows 95 used virtual memory, it's like, oh, I ran out of physical memory, but I can just like allocate more space on the hard drive, expand the page file and get more hard drive space and just use that as memory. And so what the program was doing by allocating as much memory as it could, what it was really doing was allocating as much disk space as it could. So the first thing it did was it filled your disk. And then the second thing it did was it crashed because your disk was full. <laughs> and you know, it's like, oh, now let me like save a file. I can't, there's no disk space. Uh, and so we, we added some stuff to say, oh, 
if a program tries to allocate memory, never give him more virtual memory than like twice the physical memory of the machine. So at least on a four, on a four meg machine, it would get up to eight meg and then, and it's like, okay, that's enough. Um, but the thing that I think was the most useful in terms of Acompat was there was a, a common problem in the many categories of bug, uh, many categories of games. These were games that ran under DOS extenders. A DOS extender is a mini operating system whose job it is to provide 32-bit services to applications. And so what these, what these DOS extenders did was if you were running in MS-DOS, these DOS extenders said, oh, there's no operating system around providing 32-bit services, so I will do it. So it sort of became an operating system. But if, an, if a 32-bit operating system was already running, they would say, oh, there's somebody else providing 32-bit operating system services. I don't need to. Now, these programs were written on the assumption that the DOS extender that they were packaged with was the one running the show. And so they would rel rely on things like uh, on various implementation details of their specific extender. And so when the program was running under Windows, their extender said, no, I'm, I'm not in charge. There's already an operating system here. I will let him do it. And so now this program is talking to an extender, namely Windows, that it was never intended to run against. One of the quirks of the virtualize x86 mode that the 8386 processor used and that Windows used to provide MS-DOS emulation, one of the quirks of it was that the pop flags instruction did not restore the interrupt flag. Now, Dave is nodding because he knows what that means. What it, what it means for those of you who don't spend your time staring at assembly code is that one of the bits in the processor status register is called the interrupt enable bit. And if the bit is set, then hardware interrupts are allowed. And if the bit is clear, hardware interrupts are not allowed. It, is, it was common in these applications when they needed to do some critical code and they didn't want to be interrupted was that they would save the current processor flags. So that would remember whatever the interrupt, the interrupt enable bit was and then clear the interrupt enable bit. So now it's like, okay, hardware interrupts not allowed. Do their thing and then pop the flags back into the processor to say, okay, restore the interrupt enable bit to what it was before I started doing weird things. And this didn't work in V86 mode due to a design decision in the, in the chip. And so when you perform that pop instruction, interrupts still stayed disabled, even though they were enabled originally. As a result, when you ran these games under Windows 95, they hung the machine because they disabled interrupts and interrupts never came back and they never enabled them. So like your machine was dead. It wasn't me, but one of my colleagues came up with the idea that when we saw that the, when we saw that an MS-DOS program was disabling interrupts, was performing the interrupt disable instruction. That is a privileged instruction. So we get to trap it and see that it happened. We looked around at the code nearby and saw as like, oh, there was a push and oh, there's a pop coming right after, right after it. So I'm going to set the trace flag on the register on, in the flags that were pushed. The trace flag is popped back correctly. It is not ignored by the pop instruction. What the trace flag does is it allows instruction execution to execute from one instruction and then raises a trace interrupt, which is trapped by the kernel. The kernel then sees the trace interrupt and says, oh, this is a trace interrupt mask that I, that I manually requested when the application disabled interrupts. So I will say, aha, he finally popped the flags that contained the interrupt thing set. So now I will re-enable interrupts. So this was our sneaky trick to let that incorrect code sequence, incorrect code sequence, maybe that's the wrong way of saying it, a code sequence that assumed it was running in raw MS-DOS, allowed that code sequence to work in Windows 95. And this allowed 
a large category of games to start working again once we added detection for these special interrupt sequences. Uh, the most important game, of course, in this category was Doom. Uh, Doom was the the top game. It was it was taking over. It was it was taking the world by storm, and uh, we were able to get Doom to run in an MS DOS MS DOS session under Windows ninety five, which was uh, a tremendous a tremendous success because now we could run the most important game on the planet. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. If you found the interview with Raymond to be any combination of entertaining or informative, please make sure you leave a like and that you're subscribed to the channel. If there's sufficient interest, I'll continue bringing you these interviews along with the regular content. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. This little chair will be waiting for one of you, and a rocking chair for another who likes to rock, and a big armchair for two to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage.